Well, our Bible reading today, which we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about in a moment, is from Matthew's Gospel, and it's chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. You can find that on the screen. You can look it up in your pew Bibles, or you can follow along on the service outline that you might have printed out. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. When he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Right away, a man with a serious skin disease came up and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, he touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately his disease was healed. Then Jesus told him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses prescribed as a testimony to them. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralysed in terrible agony. I'll come and heal him, he told him. Lord, the centurion replied, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be cured. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed and said to those following him, I assure you, I've not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. I tell you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus told the centurion, Go, as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was cured. At that very moment, when Jesus went into Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her. Then she got up and began to serve him. When evening came, they brought him many who were demon-possessed. He drove out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. So that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. He himself took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. This is a word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, an outline is there on your screen or in your service sheets, and there's an opportunity uh, in the comments box down the bottom uh, for you to post any comments or feedback that you might like at the end of this service, and uh, we'll try to endeavour uh, to respond to them as promptly as we can. Uh, we're four to five weeks into this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, at this point, we can start to stand back and look at the big picture and what's taken place so far. Uh, as a political tragic, uh, it's been interesting to watch and ponder the interplay of authority and action and the nature of our political landscape. Uh, it's been even more interesting watching this whole scene play out in other nations like, for example, America. Uh, two key questions have emerged as this whole crisis has unfolded, at least in a wider political sense. Now, the first question is quite clear. Where does the authority lie to make nationwide decisions about this pandemic? The second question is a little more subtle. Uh, which war is being fought here with this pandemic and the response of the authorities? Are we fighting the economic war or are we fighting the health war? What, what is the real war? Now, on the first question, Australia has navigated a what has seemed an interesting battle of authority as state and federal leaders have negotiated the areas they're responsible for, areas that are often contested, uh, from health to economics through to education and even questions about movement and association. I think, and this is a personal view, I think Scott Morrison has played a very wise card, creating a national cabinet which has brought all the key political leaders into collaboration. But it's not stopped states making decisions to go it alone, has it? On education, border control. It's also not been as nearly as chaotic or aggressive as America, where Donald Trump and the governor of New York have battled quite publicly 
over policy and authority and behavior. Now, on the second question, the issue of which war is being fought has been just as interesting to watch. It's been interesting to watch because of the way that the National Cabinet has tried to fight a war on two fronts, the economic war and the health war. Decisions made in one area, one front, have sometimes conflicted with decisions made in another area, the other front. Again, it's not nearly been as chaotic or confusing as in America, where on the one hand, President Trump has supported social distancing, and then simultaneously, on the other hand, he's had encouraged protests against social distancing. In Matthew's biography of Jesus, we've come to a similar area, authority and pandemics. But there's no confusion here about where the authority lies, nor about the nature of the war being fought. Let me pray. Father, please open our ears, hearts, minds to your word. Please confront us as we stand with the crowd with the identity of Jesus, his authority, and what he's come to do. Please work in our hearts, minds, and lives an appropriate response to Jesus, taking him at his word and living like it. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. We met Matthew briefly last year when we kicked off this series. Remember, we're going through Matthew's biography of Jesus over seven or eight years, a chunk of year. And Matthew's a man we'll spend some more time with in three weeks. He was a tax collector for the Roman occupying force of Israel. Uh, he was a Jew, one of the nation of Israel, uh, the nation descended from the family of Abraham. He's a man who is safe to say was an outsider in Jewish society. He'd made a deal with the hated Roman occupiers. He was part of an infamously corrupt profession. He was known to take money from his very own people, feathering his own nest and then giving most of it to the occupying hated force. Jesus met him. He was transformed. He came to be one of Jesus' close followers and he wrote this biography of Jesus so that people could meet Jesus as he truly was. And this biography, like those penned by Mark, Luke and John, is described as a gospel. Literally, it's good news because it's news that changes the world, news that forces everyone who hears it to make a decision about where they stand. But it doesn't change the fact that something has happened that changes the world. On the one hand, Matthew wrote for people like himself, Jews descended from Abraham, God's people, waiting for God to do as he promised in a time which seems so disappointing and so desolate, waiting for God to save the world through Abraham's family, whatever that might mean. On the other hand, Matthew wrote for people like himself, outsiders who were distant from God, on the periphery of society. In that sense, he was writing for people who might not have been Jews, who are experiencing a world that had been racked and damaged by sin and brokenness. Central to both of these audience was the idea of fulfilment. Uh, put simply, that's the idea that God's made a promise that God's made a commitment to do something about the state of the world, that God's made a promise and a binding commitment to do that through the family of Abraham and that somehow this man Jesus brings that promise to its climax, to its fulfilment. Now that idea of fulfilment is in the opening verse of Matthew. Listen to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The man that Matthew is writing about, Jesus, is connected very clearly to the great promise that God made to have his own king rule over the world, the son of David. And Matthew connects him very clearly to the great promise that God had made to deal with the broken state of the world, the state of sin in the world, the way in which humans say and live as if they're God and God's not, by bringing God's very own approval back to the world through the family of Abraham son of Abraham. But it's not exclusively for the benefit of Abraham's family. 
It's for the benefit of any person. And so in the genealogy that follows that Matthew has put together, Matthew not only lays down Jesus' genealogy and biological credentials, he actually makes clear that this man has come to deal with any person, to deal with anyone in the world, that God is interested in sinners. Remember those five women of ill repute in the genealogy? What Jesus has come to do is available to anyone connected to Jesus. It's available to any person regardless of their colour, their education, their morality, their age, their work history, their background, their family history, if they are connected to Jesus. That connection is by faith, by taking Jesus at his word and living like it. Well, Matthew made very clear that Jesus had a particular message when he came. Remember Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew also made very clear the method of Jesus as he begins to work publicly. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Now, Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. There's the message and there's the method. And last year we followed Jesus as he taught in an astounding way. As he went up a mountain and had his first teaching session or training session with his closest followers, with his disciples, a massive crowd listening in, the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus lays out what it means to be a citizen in this kingdom that he's bringing. Uh, that teaching that Matthew outlines there in Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7 is amazing. Matthew 7 verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority, not like their scribes. As Jesus descends from the mountain where he's shown his authority as a teacher, he's accompanied by a great crowd. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. I'm at point three on the outline. And what's about to happen, we're to join that crowd in seeing the authority of Jesus in his actions, his miracles, which go hand in hand with the authority of his teaching. This man is displayed from every angle as the man of authority. And Matthew's structured a series of miracles interspersed with sections on what it means to follow Jesus right through chapter 8 and into chapter 9. And the cumulative effect is for us, the crowd, to see the authority of Jesus as a teacher and in his actions and to ask ourselves, what do I make of this man? How do I deal with him? What is my response? Matthew gives us a very clear image of his identity through his authority and he forces us to ask, what am I going to do with that truth? Now, it's not the time or place to debate the nature of miracles. For Matthew, there's no question that they occurred. Now, in fact, as a person who's been brought in by Jesus from the outside, the miracles go inseparably for Matthew with the teaching of Jesus. They establish his whole identity as the one promised by God to deal with the broken nature of the world. As Matthew descends, as Jesus descends from the mountain, Matthew shows us three miracle incidents. Now, they all seem to occur in the area around which Jesus worked for the majority of his public ministry, an area centered on Capernaum in the north of Israel. Now, the first miracle involves the healing of a man with a serious skin disease, verses 2 to 4. The second miracle involves a centurion with a very sick servant, Verses 5 to 13. The third involves the mother-in-law of one of Jesus' closest followers. Verses 14 to 15. A whole section is closed out where it began with another large crowd surrounding Jesus. Except this time he's dealing with many who are possessed by demons. And Matthew offers his assessment of the situation. Well, when you stand back and look at these three incidents, these three miracles, you'll notice that they all share some common features. Each miracle involves an outsider. 
Each of these episodes involves an outsider, someone on the periphery of polite Jewish society. A Leon Morris, a commentator on Matthew, an Australian, go you Aussies, describes them as not being accepted into the full worship of God by God's people. In the first episode, it's a man with a serious skin disease, probably leprosy, verse 2. Those with skin diseases were seen as unclean, uh, afflicted in some special way by the brokenness of the world. They are excluded from normal society and the normal gathering of God's people. They knew it and they had to make it public as they walked, yelling out, heralding their coming by, saying, unclean, unclean. And so everyone else knew it. In the second episode, it's a man who is a significant participant in the occupation of Israel, a Roman centurion, verse 5. Most probably he was a Gentile. So he had two strikes against him. He was a Gentile and he was part of an occupying oppressive force. Matthew was familiar with such men. Remember his job as a tax collector? He knew where this man stood in Jewish society. And the third episode, it's a feverish woman, verse 14. A woman were not allowed to join with the Jewish man in full worship of God by his people. And on top of that, she was sick. It's important to see that none of these miracles turn on a request of Jesus. The man with the skin disease approaches with a humble statement of fact. Look at verse 2. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. The centurion approaches with similar humility and a a statement. Verse 6, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony and Peter's mother-in-law says nothing. She just lies there. Look there in verse 14. Jesus went into Peter's house and saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. In none of these incidents is there a presumption that Jesus is obligated to heal. There's no request made of him, just a bare acceptance that he can and he will if he desires. Each miracle involves Jesus reaching out to the outsider. In each of these episodes, Jesus takes the initiative to reach out to the outsider in a a way that is remarkable. Uh, In each action, Jesus himself runs the risk of public perception that he's now himself unclean and so should be excluded. He's not, but his initiative to reach out is at a great risk to himself. He reaches out to touch the leper. No one should do that. He volunteers to attend and enter the Gentile centurion's host and house and no one should do that because it made you unacceptable. And he voluntarily touches a woman and no respectable Jewish man would do that in public let alone a woman who is sick. There's a level of initiative here which is mixed with unbelievable public compassion. The mixture of the two speaks loudly of a grace that will come at great personal expense. Jesus doing things for people that they don't deserve but desperately need. Jesus is revealed as the man with compassion and mercy and grace unparalleled at great personal cost to himself. But the grace and compassion is not without substance because in each area there is a display of Jesus' authority, his amazing authority over illness and sickness. The leper is healed, the centurion's servant is healed, Peter's mother-in-law is healed. In each, it's the powerful word of Jesus that's there at the front. He speaks and illness is dealt with. He touches and illness is dealt with. But our attention is there again and again on his word. His authority is in his word. And it is an amazing authority. The outcome in each involves complete restoration. Now, this is really important to recognise. It's not just healing that Jesus brings, but restoration, the return to what should be. The return to what should be. It's most striking at the end 
and the start of these three episodes. Come with me to the start because in that first episode, a look in verse 2, the leper doesn't ask for healing, doesn't even make a request, a statement of question, or he just says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. His desire is not just health, but to be cleansed, to be restored, to be restored to full humanity and community that he'd lost. That's why Jesus commands at the end of that little episode are so important. This man has to traipse all the way down to Jerusalem so that he can publicly display at the centre of the place where God's people meet God, so that he can display there that he's clean and receive a certificate of cleanliness so that he can be returned and restored inside and out to full health as an individual and in community. The last scene, which we'll come to in a moment, kind of like a closing bookend, is one of darkness and the demonic. The close happens in the night. It's like a scene from some kind of horror movie as out of the darkness all the demon possessed are brought to Jesus. Faced by physical and spiritual darkness, Jesus speaks and a full cleansing, a full restoration happens as the spirits are driven away. You, it's unavoidable that you have this image of a man standing there surrounded by darkness with compassionate and gracious and merciful authority speaking, not using tricks or warfare, but speaking and restoring people in the darkness seems to lift. Matthew closes with this final section in verses 16 to 17 because he wants to make an assessment of what Jesus is doing and who Jesus is. Look again at verses 16 and 17. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. He drove out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. He himself took our weaknesses and carried our diseases. On that point four on the outline, Matthew's assessment is very clear. Jesus' actions across these three episodes tie very closely to who he is. Who Jesus is is connected to God's promise to deal with the broken state of the world. And to make his point, Matthew states very clearly that Jesus is fulfilling a picture from one of the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah. He's actually quoting from one of the most famous passages in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Uh, Here in a number of similar sections, Isaiah proclaims God's purpose to fulfill his promise to deal with human sin and the broken world through a figure, a man called the servant. A servant will come as one of humanity, as a human being. This servant will come as a central figure in God's plan and promise to deal with human sin. This servant will actually bear the judgment of God on human sin on himself. Put simply, the servant will die in place of sinners, taking the judgment that sinners deserve for them. But Matthew doesn't see this as just a moment in time, that moment when the servant dies. Matthew understands that the whole issue of human sin the whole issue of our attitude and action that says I'm God and God's not, that whole issue of human sin has fundamentally broken not just humans but the world at large. And part of that whole package of brokenness, of what sin has done, what sin is, is illness and sickness, being outside what God designed. So when this servant comes, he'll display his ability His authority to deal with sin by the authority he displays in his everyday life. He'll start to set the world aright, restoring it as he completes his job to deal with human sin. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here, isn't it? He's displaying in his day-to-day life his authority and purpose. He's come to deal with sin and the miracles he commits show his authority to do the whole mission as God promised. And when you think about that, it shouldn't surprise us 
or Matthew's original readers. You see, the promise of God way back in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, the promise of God to Abraham was for the rolling back of curse in the world and the bringing of blessing at God's initiative and decision. Uh, Looking back on what we have just seen in these three small miracle episodes, we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus acts like this. He's showing that he's come to deal with the pandemic of human sin and he has the authority to do so. Moreover, Matthew's assessment of Jesus' work is helpful in making sure that we keep our eyes on the big picture. The big picture is not physical wellness or well-being for humans. The real front is dealing with sin, which is at the heart of human and world brokenness. Matthew wants us to have Jesus' authority within the big picture of the real purpose of Jesus' work. Now, one of the interesting parts of reading about authority and how to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and which war we're fighting, I'm at point five on the outline, is how various people have responded to different assertions of authority and various policy decisions. One of the most cutting was from the governor of New York as he was responding to one of Donald Trump's assertions of supreme authority. Andrew Cuomo, the governor, stated that in America we have a president, not a king. Matthew has constructed this whole series of episodes to draw out our reaction, our reaction to the authority of Jesus and the real front of the real war. And he's done that by baiting very clearly the identity of Jesus, his authority and mission, and he wants us to respond. The presence of the crowd at the start and the end places us with those observers. And then in the middle episode, the one with the centurion, Jesus actually turns, you'll notice in a moment, and speaks to the crowd in such a way that we're forced to consider our response. I mean, Jesus' identity is very clear. He has the authority to deal with the whole package of human sin and his life is central to that. As he moves to the climax of that event where he'll deal with human sin as God promised, he displays his authority clearly in bringing outsiders in, in restoring broken people, in showing his gracious and compassionate initiative. Is that the Jesus you know? As he does that, his purpose is very clear. Jesus has come to do with the whole package of human sin. In that sense, he's always bringing the outsider in, always taking the initiative and at his own expense. On a daily level, he's restoring broken people, feeling the particularly sharp effects of a broken world in illness and sickness. On a big picture level, this shows his place in God's plans as the one who's come to do with the sin of the world of all humans who are outsiders because all of us are outside right relationship with God. Is that the purpose of Jesus that you know and love? And then smack bang in the middle of these episodes, in the centurion, we have the template of how to relate to this man Jesus as he truly is. Jesus makes clear in that central episode that faith is the right way to deal with him. (coughs) Not undefined faith, but faith as a centurion displays. Faith that is in Jesus, that has heard him, seen him, thought on him, that takes him and his identity and words and actions as true and then acts like it. Faith that sees, hears and thinks on Jesus that takes him, his identity, his words, actions and authority as true and acts like it. To deal with Jesus in faith, to take him as he is and his words and deeds as they are and to live like it, means that Jesus is available to all who trust in him. That's the remarkable thing about the centurion. And you notice that when Jesus talks about him in verse 10, he turns to the crowd and speaks to them so that they pay attention to their reaction to Jesus. Dealing rightly with Jesus is not a matter of your family tree. I mean, look at his. It's not a matter of your skin colour, your education, which street you live in, 
your family history or a track record of good deeds and right behaviour. Dealing with Jesus rightly is simply a matter of seeing him, hearing him, knowing his identity and taking that as true and acting on it, just like the centurion. The alternative, there in verse 12, the alternative is just too awful to bear. Is that how you deal with Jesus? In faith? Is that the Jesus you offer to other people? To any person? That they can come to him by taking him at his word? trusting it and living like it. Let me pray. Dear Father, thank you for this snapshot of Jesus' identity. Matthew's going to do this a number of times in this section of his biography. And we come face to face with a man who is wonderfully gracious and compassionate at his own initiative and at great self-expense. We come to a man who has undeniable authority to bring the outsiders in, We come to a man whose authority is to be fought in a war on the right front day to day and ultimately in dealing with sin, the whole package of sin and the brokenness that comes with it. Father, help us to know this Jesus, so magnificent in his authority and compassion. Help us to know this purpose of Jesus, that he's come to roll back the curse of sin and to bring your approval. Father, help us to offer this Jesus at a time when the whole world is beset by a pandemic. Help us to offer the one who deals with the pandemic of our sin with the right authority. In his name we pray. Amen.